Why, hello there. My name is Annie from Dayton Nursery in Norton, Ohio, and welcome to our first ever virtual seminar. Now, because of the pandemic, we had to do things a bit differently, so this year our winter seminar series will not be in person, but it'll be here on the internet. Uh, you can watch these videos at any time after this, and if you have any questions about what I talk about today, please feel free to ask those in the comments below. Or you can email us at info at DaytonNursery.com. <music> So our first talk this year is about those smaller trees in the landscape. These can be accent trees, street trees, a trees you plant near a patio, and trees you plant near the corner of the house. These are trees that need to be on the smaller side, whether it be height or spread. These trees can provide some shade, bloom power, unique shapes, fall color, fruit and season long color, plus attract wildlife, including pollinators. Now some of the trees I'll talk about today are naturally dwarf trees. They will stay small. And some have been grafted, uh, which means they take on the rootstock of another plant. You usually have a main trunk, and then you have the top of the plant is more like a ball shape, and that's where your foliage is. For example, that would be a lilac tree, and we'll get to that later. I will also today discuss smaller trees that would be acceptable to use in a wide array of soil and light. Uh, so we will talk well-drained, dry soil, moist soil, full blazing sun and part shade. So even though these trees grow a little bit on the smaller side, you do need to give them room to grow. Unfortunately, a lot of people do plant trees that's, you know, you buy them small, but they may grow bigger. They plant them too close to the house. So be sure you pay attention to that mature height and spread on the tag. So let's say we have a magnolia, mature height 15 foot by spread of 10 to 15 foot. So from the edge of a house, for example, or a deck, you'd want to plant that a half the distance of its spread. So if it's 10 to 15 foot wide at maturity, you'd want to give that at least five feet away from the house at planting time. Luckily, these smaller trees I'll talk about today usually do not have invasive root systems, so they can be planted next to something like your home or even water lines and septic lines. So even though I have an alphabetical list today to go off of, I'm going to go in my own order and I am going to start with my absolute favorite tree from this list. It's one that isn't used very often. It's not very common, but it is absolutely gorgeous. We have one planted at the nursery. I have one planted at home and it is the seven sunflower tree. A uh, heptacodium is its botanical name. As I said, not very common in the landscape or actually to be able to find at garden centers. This tree gets about 15 to 20 feet tall by 10 to 15 foot wide. And why is it my favorite? Well, it's absolutely gorgeous. It has a beautiful shape. You get really nice, larger green leaves you know, in the summer. And what's nice about this tree is it actually blooms late, late summer into fall with beautiful white blooms that really attract the pollinators. I have a picture here of bees all over those flowers at the nursery last summer. And then you get absolutely stunning peeling bark, you know, as it ages. Absolutely gorgeous tree, well-drained soil, full sun, very easy to grow. In addition to that one is a new proven winter variety of the seven sun tree called Temple of Bloom. That is actually the one I have at home. I thought I'd give it a try. I really like it. It's better for a suburban lot. It's smaller. It's six to 10 foot high by barely 10 feet wide. So if you have a smaller space, that's a good Good idea for a tree uh, for that spot. It is very similar to its cousin, or I guess it would be its parent. Uh, it has those really beautiful white blooms that actually, after they bloom, they turn more of a reddish color, so you get very long season of color. You get those really nice foliage, and you get the peeling bark as well. And just as its parent, it is also attractive to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. So the next tree is the Rose of Sharon tree, this Hibiscus syriacus. This is a hardy hibiscus tree. Uh, you might be used to the tropical looking flowers of the hibiscus that are not hardy here, or the large dinner plate flowers of the perennial hibiscus, but this is its cousin. This is the Rose of Sharon, also hibiscus. Uh, flowers are about this size in a multitude of different colors. And you may think, but I thought that was just a shrub. Well, it is, but it can also be available in grafted form. Again, this is a tree that is good for late season interest. So instead of those typical spring bloomers, this one will bloom later in the fall or later in the summer into the fall. Very easy to grow. And there's quite a few new varieties on the market that are seedless. So you're not gonna get all those little babies popping up in your yard. 
So two of our favorite varieties of Rose of Sharon in tree form are Minerva and Aphrodite. They are actually extremely similar. Uh, Minerva is more on the lavender side, while Aphrodite is more of a dark pink with a dark red eye. Uh, at maturity, they'll probably get about eight to 10 foot tall and wide in that tree form. And another thing about these is feel free to prune these guys back. If you wanna prune them back in the spring or even late spring, they will still grow, they will still produce buds, and they will still bloom for you no matter what. So the next tree is a weeping tree, very popular weeping tree. It is the weeping pea tree. Now there are two different kinds of this uh, weeping tree. One is called walkeri, one is called pendula. Uh, they are very similar in growth habit and how they look. Uh, their foliage is just a tiny bit different. Uh, this tree is one that you would like if you don't want a tree to grow hardly at all. When you come to the nursery and you pick out your tree and you plant it, even five years later, it is barely gonna grow. And for some people, that's a good thing. So at maturity, this tree may grow six to eight feet tall by wide, but that will take a very long time. And most trees that I've seen in the landscape do not even get that big. Now it does get tiny yellow pea-like flowers in the spring. They are quite insignificant. They're hard to see, they're not very big but those are followed by the uh, probably like a medium green, smaller leaf uh, on that tree. The difference between the pendula and walkeri variety of this tree is that pendula has the thicker, coarser foliage, but still delicate looking, and the walkeri has an overall ferny look. And this tree can go just about anywhere. It's extremely hardy up to zone three. Uh, it can take full sun, part shade, well-drained soil, dryness, uh, drought tolerant, and it also can handle strong winds. Now we'll get to a native tree, our own Eastern Redbud. This tree has definitely gained in popularity at the garden center. There are many varieties available in different colors, different shapes, different sizes, and new ones coming out each and every year. They are well known for their showy blooms, usually on the pink side, sometimes reddish, sometimes white, that actually bloom along the branches, not usually on like a little stem, but up and down the bare branches in the spring. After that bloom, which is very showy by the way, you get those large heart-shaped leaves, uh, usually available in green, and also something like Ruby Falls or other varieties, you can get more of a burgundy tone. Some of these keep their burgundy foliage throughout summer, and some also fade back to green uh, by midsummer. Now these trees are usually available in a single trunk, just one trunk form or a multi-trunk form. So depending on exactly what you're looking for and where in the landscape it needs to go, there are different forms. There are also weeping forms that stay very small. That would be like your Covey and your Ruby Falls, which we will get to. Uh, those are great landscape plants. Now these trees tolerate deer. So if you have a deer problem, that would be a great choice for you. They are native, so they can tolerate our clay soil. And for any of those with a black walnut, luckily mine fell down in a windstorm last year, so I'm done with it. Uh, if you have a black walnut, this tree can handle being planted near it because of the black walnut toxicity that is in the soil. So the most common eastern redbud is just your Circus canadensis, the species form. Uh, you get your pink flowers, your green heart-shaped leaves. This tree that grows to about 15 to 20 feet tall and wide has nice branching, good fall color as well, and textured bark for good winter interest. If you're looking for something other than just green foliage, you might want to try Force Pansy Redbud. That's another one with pink, very vibrant pink blooms. But the foliage emerges a shimmering purple. This one also has like a reddish orange fall color and also grows about 15 to 20 foot tall and wide. So let's talk about a brand new variety, Rising Sun. We had it for the first time last year. We were all stunned by it. This tree is absolutely gorgeous. What it does, it's different than the other red buds, is it, the leaves uh, pop out, they're green, but then they mature to shades of orange and reds and pinks, all at different intervals. So your tree has different leaves with different casts of color. This one has a rosy lavender colored flower. And this particular variety you can plant in full sun. It is burn resistant. Uh, so even if it's in blazing hot full sun all day, it should retain its color very well. This one grows only to eight to 12 feet tall by eight foot wide, making a great dwarf tree for the landscape. Now, Flamethrower is another brand new variety that we had just last year. It is very similar to Rising Sun as the leaves you know, mature to different colors. They merge burgundy red, move to green, move to yellow. So you have different shades of color on the plant at the same time. 
and this color is very persistent through the season. You know, you could have up to four or five colors on the same tree at the same time. This one you want to grow just for its foliage and it grows 15 to 20 feet tall by 15 foot wide. Now let's talk about the weeping forms of red bud. You have Vanilla Twist, Ruby Falls, and Covey. Uh, Ruby Falls is definitely one of the favorites from landscapers. I know our two landscape designers love to use this in their designs and for good reason. It is a great plant. It gives you burgundy foliage almost all season long, beautiful weeping form. You have those beautiful heart-shaped leaves, pink flowers in the spring, and it stays very compact. And then on the other hand, you have vanilla twist. So if you're looking for something more with more traditional looking, this one has white flowers, stays compact just like its cousins, and has green heart-shaped leaves. Now, Kobe, also known as the lavender twist red bud, is the most well-known of the weepers, the one that's been around the most. Uh, it has more of a pinkish lavender flower on another dwarf form of tree. And what's nice about these three different weepers is different graft heights. I have a Ruby Falls red bud that is literally this high and won't get any taller. There's uh, different weeping red buds that could be three, four, five, six foot high. They will not grow any taller, but they will get wider. So as they grow, they'll bring out new branches and the tree gets wider and wider. So if you have a spot that's limited in height, or if you just have a window or something where you need a smaller tree, one of these reaping red buds is a great choice. The next tree I'm gonna talk about is, is the fringe tree. This is a native tree to Southern Ohio and definitely well known mostly for its bloom and its bloom power. The white, slightly fragrant flowers in drooping clusters are like fringe-like and airy hence the name fringe tree. This tree prefers well-drained soils, but it can tolerate moist soils. This tree also adapts well to urban settings and can definitely be used as a street tree, you know, near the street or that strip between the street and your sidewalk. Another one of Tom Dayton's personal favorites is Franklinia, the Ben Franklin tree. Uh, this was grabbed as a seedling back in 1765 to honor the one and only Ben Franklin. Now this tree is more of an open shape, usually multi-branched. It has white, decent size, and if you know what a camellia is, kind of like a camellia shaped flower with like an egg yolk colored center, very showy, quite floriferous. You get a lot of flowers on this tree as well. Uh, what's nice about this tree is it blooms later in the summer, unlike all those other spring bloomers giving you good fall interest. And speaking of fall interest, this tree with you know regular medium green foliage in the summer turns beautiful and bright shades of reds and oranges and purples to also give you fall interest. And it will grow in well-drained soil, gets to be about 15 to 20 feet tall. So one of my other favorite trees on this list is a hydrangea tree. You may think, but I thought they were just shrubs. Well, they can also be grafted into a tree. So you get your main trunk, you get a whole bunch of foliage and gorgeous flowers on top. And what's nice about the hydrangea tree is they usually only graft the paniculata type of hydrangeas onto these trees, which means it blooms on new wood, which means you're gonna get blooms each and every year, no matter what, no matter when you trim. Uh, great choice for the side of the house. They can also tolerate full sun, part shade. Um, I had mine in some drier soil that did well. It could probably take a little bit of moisture as well. Uh, there's quite a few varieties of these trees and more and more coming every year. Probably one of the most common trees um, for hydrangeas is the limelight. Definitely one of the most popular hydrangeas on the market today. It is a proven winter variety. It is most well known for flowers that come out more mid to late summer. They start out green actually, turn to white, then fade to shades of pinks and reds. This tree will grow to about eight to 10 foot tall and wide. And just like all of the hydrangeas in this group, you will need to prune these back a bit in early spring. Another hydrangea variety that's very popular for tree form is Pink Diamond. Uh, the large cone shaped flowers open creamy white and gradually change pinks to reds from early, to, from early summer to midsummer to fall, giving you a nice showy color throughout that season. And next is one of my personal all-time favorite varieties of hydrangea, and that is called Quick Fire. Not only does it bloom earlier than any other of the paniculata hydrangeas, I have noticed personally at my own house having a Quick Fire shrub, the pollinators actually really like this one. The bees are all over it. I have a limelight also, and they're not as fond of it. So I really like having this Quick Fire. You get, the flowers are cone-shaped just like the other, 
But the florets, each individual floret seems to be a little bit larger and a little bit more airy, but still dense. So these flowers will open white and then start fading to pink and into red as fall progresses. And if you're familiar with the vanilla strawberry hydrangea, it makes a terrific tree form. Uh, it is mostly known for its absolutely enormous flower panicles. Now these are big, big flowers. They start out white and again turn to pinks and reds, but this one seems to, each individual flower seems to change at a different pace. So you can have all of those different flower colors on the plant at one time. So now we're gonna talk about another tree that's quite rare, quite unique, and it is the golden chain tree, also known as a bean tree. This one is completely different. It doesn't bloom white or pink or purple, but you get yellow showy flowers, 24 inch long raised seams of yellow flowers in the spring. This tree is absolutely beautiful, very showy. Your neighbors will definitely be talking about this one. And then after it's done blooming, you get attractive, almost clover-like medium green foliage. And after this tree blooms, it actually produces a seed pod similar to like a wisteria. What we do suggest is to remove these as soon as they start producing. Uh, this way, the, the plant's energy goes into the roots of the plant instead of trying to produce these seeds, which we don't need. Uh, this tree really does well in well-drained soil, full sun, part shade. Now, if it is an extremely sunny or windy spot, we would suggest afternoon shade for this one. This tree matures to about 20 feet tall by 15 foot wide. Usually at the nursery, I've noticed when these plants are young, they're quite tall and slender. Now we're gonna get into the really large group of magnolia, another one of my absolutely favorites. These magnolias can be evergreen, semi-evergreen, deciduous. You can get flowers that are big, that are small, that are white, that are pink, that are purple, pretty much everything and anything you could want. But there are some newer varieties on the market that are uh, they're really nice. They're very showy, but they also stay compact. I would say my favorite out of these new ones is called Genie. What's nice about Genie, it's a smaller pyramidal form, could probably fit almost anywhere in the landscape. It has very dark reddish purple buds opening to very dark burgundy flowers that are extremely showy. Plus they are lightly scented. They bloom from spring into early summer. This one is definitely a must have. And what's nice about Genie is it may even rebloom here and there in the summer and only grows to 10 to 15 foot tall by five foot wide at maturity. Now this next group of magnolia is one we haven't been carrying very often. I don't know why, they're great choices. Uh, it's called The Girls. Uh, two of the varieties included in this are Anne and Jane. These particular varieties are named after female employees or daughters of employees of the US Arena back in 1965. Now the bloom color on these ranges from deep pink to deep purple, uh, depending on the variety, and they are more of a multi-trunk form, so you get a bunch of branches from the base, usually growing to eight to 15 feet tall and wide on that one. Uh, the next variety is called Butterflies. This one is a yellow bloomer and it fits its name. Uh, the yellow flowers kind of float on the tree, kind of like a butterfly, blooming early in the spring, and the flowers even have like a light lemon oil aroma to them. And after those flowers have fallen, you get attractive dark green foliage uh, throughout the summer. On this tree that grows about 15 to 20 foot high by about 15 foot wide. Another newer variety of magnolia on the market is called Emerald Tower. This is a sweet bay magnolia type, so it is semi-evergreen. You get those typical white flowers, uh, but it stays smaller, you know, 15 to 20 feet tall and wide, but it still features those very rich, very dark green uh, foliage throughout the summer. And don't forget those blooms are also somewhat sporadic. You can see them again throughout summer here or there on the tree. Uh, the next magnolia is called Alexandrina. This is a saucer type magnolia. We love it at the nursery. In fact, we have a few planted around the owl barn and I think over in the botanical garden too. Uh, this tree is filled with flowers in the spring. Those are the ones that you really notice when you're driving around and you see a big shot of pinkish purple flowers in someone's landscape. Absolutely gorgeous tree. In fact, this tree dates back to 1831. That's how long it's been around and it's still very popular today. Uh, this tree usually grows to just 10 to 12 feet high by about 10 foot wide. And this tree is one of those that's also usually available in either the single trunk form or the multi-trunk form. So you can have it either just a single specimen tree or more of a shrub looking tree. Another yellow blooming magnolia is called Sensation. You get large six to seven inch flowers. What's nice about this particular variety is the blooms tend to come out a little bit later. 
So if there's a late spring frost, usually they bloom after a typical late spring frost here in Ohio. So usually they will not get zapped by the cold and you will usually every year get those really beautiful flowers. This one is an outstanding tight pyramidal form, uh, really nice green foliage throughout the summer as well. And going back to the sweet bay type magnolias, Magnolia virginiana, the regular species form, well known for its medium to dark green glossy foliage with actually a silvery underside. So when the breeze falls through the tree, the leaves kind of flip a little bit, giving it like a shimmering look to it. It's very nice. And then in early summer, you get those typical white magnolia flowers. Those are well scented, sends a nice scent throughout the air while those are blooming. And again, those bloom off and on again throughout the summer months. This one grows about 18 foot tall by 10 foot wide. So it's another tall grower, but thin. Uh, this one we suggest to site outside of an area that may have strong winds. Uh, an area that's slightly windy may cause some damage to the leaves, not only in the summer, but definitely in the winter as well. Okay, do you know, of course, we have to talk about crab apples, and these are not your grandmother's crab apple trees. Uh, the newer crab apple varieties have been bred to not only flower beautifully and have beautiful shape and foliage color, but they are no longer messy. You're not getting those large crab apple fruits that get all over your lawn. You step on them, you get applesauce after you're walking through your yard. Uh, these are well known for, the, they still get the fruit, but they're usually extremely small, but they persist on the tree for a long time. So not only is that showy, but the, tr the fruit will shrivel up and shrivel up and shrivel up to less than the size of a raisin, eventually fall off, unless they're eaten by wildlife or birds. Uh, there are quite a few very nice varieties. I will start with Royal Raindrops. Uh, what's nice about this one is it's a disease resistant cultivar with vibrant burgundy red spring flowers and reddish purple non-messy fruits that appear more in the summer. Uh, this tree has kind of like cut leaf foliage, not your typical crab apple foliage, but very showy. Uh, it merges burgundy and retains its rich color through the heat of the summer with bronze, orange, and purple fall color. And this one grows 20 feet by 15 foot wide. One of the most popular varieties of crabapple is called Showtime. This is an excellent pyramidal grower, disease-free foliage. You get vibrant pinkish flowers in the spring, along with those non-messy fruits in the fall. The foliage on this one is dark green with a reddish overcast. And this one grows about 10 to 15 feet tall and wide, so another nice dwarf form. Another newer one on the market is called Gladiator. This one, I think, would take the place of something like a Bradford or Cleveland Select Pear, which, in case you do not know, as of next year, will no longer be on the market. I know not, and it will be on Ohio's invasive tree list, so if you want one, get one. Uh, but you, we will need to start finding alternates for that tree, and that tree is not on this list today. Um, but Gladiator is similar in shape. And this one has bright pink flowers in the spring, followed by, again, those non-messy uh, reddish fruits. And this one actually has a good color. It has burgundy foliage that keeps its color throughout the season. So if you're looking for something other than just a regular green leaf tree, this is a great choice. So another one of these awesome crab apples is Coral Burst. Definitely a favorite of the landscapers uh, for landscape designs. But what's really nice about this tree is kind of a two-tone effect in a way. You get your tight coral red buds and they open to a lighter colored, fluffy, double pink flower. So the two-tone effect of the darker bud and the light flower is quite showy in the landscape. And this compact slow grower only grows to about eight foot tall and wide, so it's perfect for just about any spot. And the last tree in the uh, crab apple family is called lollipop, and it looks just like that. It looks like a lollipop, again, with that straight trunk, big round ball on the top with a profusion, very floriferous, uh, of white flowers in the spring. Now this tree is truly dwarf. It'll keep that size. Uh, great for, you know, around a patio or in a perennial garden as a nice accent. This is a great tree. Okay, so this next tree isn't your typical small flowering tree, but boy is it showy and it's an alternate to a flowering tree. And that's the Weeping Pussy Willow Adore form, Salix Capria Pendula. And now, no, it doesn't flower exactly, but it gets those silvery catkins all up and down this weeping tree. It forms like almost like a natural umbrella. It's absolutely beautiful in the spring uh, with those catkins. They're fluffy, uh, they're kind of silvery. Now this is a willow, uh, so it lends itself to planting near streams and ponds, wet spots, 
If you have a sunken spot, this tree should work just fine for you. Now the mature size on this tree, I can't actually give you because it depends on the actual graft height. Usually when we sell these trees are about my height. So I'd say four to five, six feet tall. Uh, they shouldn't get much taller than that, but they will start to get wider at maturity. Now, if you're like me, this next tree is one of your favorites. You enjoy it set, you enjoy cutting it in the spring and bringing it in for a cut flower arrangement, and that tree is a lilac. Yes, they come in shrub form, but they come in grafted tree forms as well, uh, quite a few different types. One of the newer varieties of tree and shrub forms is a proven winner called Bloomeray. If you haven't heard of Bloomeray, that is a re-bloomer. So what's nice about that is it'll give you your profusion of flowers and Bloomerang uh, is available in like purple, dark purple and pink nowadays. It'll give you a profusion of flowers in the spring then it blooms off and on again throughout the summer. Now we've had these plants for years now. They do perform this way and they do keep a slight fragrance throughout the summer as well. Uh, Bloomerang, especially those varieties get about six feet tall by four to five feet wide. Uh, the next lilac tree is the dwarf Korean lilac or also known as Myrai Palabin, if you're looking at the botanical name on its tag. This one is very dense. It'll give you a very nice dense form at the top. Uh, the flowers bloom as the foliage emerges. So you get your typical lilac purple fragrant flower in the spring. And this one is a little bit different from other varieties because the leaves are very small. So that's kind of where you get that dense form. Uh, again, a great tree for the landscape. And similar to that tree, but the foliage is a little bit bigger, is Miss Kim. And usually those flowers come af as or after the foliage emerges, so you have both on the same plant. Again, a very fragrant plant, uh, stays dwarf and compact. Also, again, for any of the lilacs in this family, if you need to prune it, uh, and you can safely, do it right as the flowers fade or have already faded in the spring. Doing it any later than that could cut the buds off for next season's blooms. So be sure to do that right as the flowers fade. Similar to those two is a newer variety from Proven Winter called Tinkerbell. Uh, this is a pink form. It has a darker pink bud opening to a lighter pink, sweetly fragrant flower. These trees usually get about six foot to four to five foot wide, depending on graft height. I've kind of seen these a little different. Um, some of them are about my height, some are taller than me. Um, from what we've had in the garden center. And this one is disease resistant, compact, tough, and durable. And it may not resemble a typical lilac, but one of the most common street trees you'll see around is the ivory silk lilac tree. Now this is a white bloomer. It does get a little bigger than its cousins uh, to 20 to 25 feet tall by 15 to 20 foot wide. The flowers on this one with a captivating scent are white and they can be up to 12 inches long. So this is a very showy bloomer. Uh, the flowers are almost slightly fluffy looking, so they're not quite typical lilac flower type. Uh, the rich green foliage throughout summer is also very attractive as well as the reddish brown bark. Okay, so we have two plant families left to go. And you've probably been wondering why I haven't talked about this one yet. And that's the cherry family or plum family. Now, I'm not talking about fruiting plants. I'm talking about the ornamental cherries and the ornamental plums that do not produce fruit. Now, the most commonly used landscape plant uh, from this family is the weeping cherry. Those come in a couple different varieties these days. You have your regular pendula, which is your pink flowers. Now, this one we do have growing at the nursery right uh, behind the old farmhouse. It is big. It has gotten big over the years. A lot of times these are grafted at four, five, or six foot tall. So luckily when you take this tree home, it won't get as big for you at maturity. Uh, but you've got those, you know, the umbrella shaped uh, stems with, you're know, covered with those fluffy, typical cherry-like uh, pink blooms in the spring. And then there's also the common white weeping cherry called snow fountains. This tree has a tendency of staying more dwarf, more compact than the pink form. Usually this one's also available in different graft heights, um, four foot, five foot, six foot, just depending on what you're looking for. This one has a profusion of white flowers in the spring. Again, the nice weeping umbrella-like shape. Now these you can actually prune as you wish. You can have it so where the, the stems go all the way to the ground and cascade, or you can you know, trim it right up as an umbrella. But keep in mind, the more you trim, the more you're gonna have to trim. Um, this plant responds very well to pruning, 
but that means it'll grow and grow and grow. So if you start trimming, remember, this is something you might have to do one or two, even three times per year, every year, once you get going. Keeping with the cherry theme, there is a royal burgundy flowering cherry. You may be familiar with an older variety called Kwanzaan, uh, which isn't necessarily on the market anymore. There are more improved varieties such as this one. It is slower growing and slightly darker pink flower of the popular Kwanzaan, uh, yet it spreads a little bit more. And it's called Royal Burgundy because of its reddish purple foliage during the season. Uh, this tree gets to be about 20 feet high by 15 foot wide. And in the same family, but it's not a cherry, it's a plum, the thundercloud flowering plum. Again, a very popular variety over the past years. Uh, this one is a tree if you want something other than green foliage again. You have beautiful plum colored foliage that really retains its color well throughout the summer months and a profusion of pink flowers, you know, typical plum type cherry flowers in the spring. And this one gets to be about 15 to 25 foot tall and wide. The Autumn Brilliant Service Berry is another small tree with clean, bluish green foliage in the summer, turning to brilliant orange red in fall. It is said that the term service berry referred to the bloom time in which the roads in the Appalachian Mountains became passable, allowing preachers to resume church services after a long winter. This tree explodes with pretty white flowers in the spring, but is grown mainly for its edible dark red fruits that birds love. And in the olden days, it was common to make pies out of these fruits. This excellent disease resistant tree also serves as a host for butterfly larvae. It'll grow to 15 to 20 foot tall and wide in a wide range of soil types. Last but not least, again, one of my favorite groups of flowering trees. They are so showy, so pretty, but kind of tough to grow. So that's why I left it last. And that is the flowering dogwood. Here in Ohio, there are two different forms of dogwood. You have your kusa, which is your Chinese type, and Florida, which is your American type. Now the Florida type is your typical, all American, early spring blooming dogwood. Uh, you see those in abundance everywhere. But the kusa, the Chinese type, is slightly different. It has smaller foliage uh, and it blooms later in the spring, usually into June sometimes. So that is a great tree to extend the bloom power in your landscape. You could have an early spring bloomer cherry, then you could have a kusa dogwood to extend that bloom time throughout late, uh, late spring to early summer. If you're looking for a bloom succession, uh, the Florida dogwoods usually bloom right after the red buds out in the landscapes in Ohio. Now the main thing about growing dogwoods you have to remember is they are extremely shallow rooted. But by being shallow rooted, that means the soil needs to be extremely well drained. They do not like to be sitting in water. So be sure to cite this tree correctly. Now keeping with the American dogwoods are probably our favorite variety and the most hardy variety of this group is called Cloud Nine. It has an abundance of typical dogwood white flowers in the spring. Uh, this tree, like I said, is very hardy, grows to be about 15 feet tall and wide. Now the one I have, which is one of my favorites, is called Rubra. Uh, Cornus Florida Rubra, just your typical pink flowering dogwood. I like this one because it's very showy, has a very nice color to the pink, a uh, very nice pink color to the bloom. It also stays slightly smaller than Cloud Nine, so it's great for a smaller spot. Again, gets to be about 15 foot tall and wide. And now getting into our favorite Chinese type varieties of dogwoods. Uh, number one definitely is Radiant Rose, uh, very vibrant, beautiful pinkish colored flowers. Early summer, and then you get your glossy deep green foliage throughout the rest of the season. And then come fall, you get a really nice reddish purple color. This particular variety exhibits strong growth, excellent bloom production. Uh, it gets to be about 15 foot tall and wide. Another newer one we've had is uh, called Kusa Scarlet Fire. This one has five inch, nice and large size, scarlety pinkish red flowers uh, early in the summer. And then come late summer, you get like a one inch showy pinkish red fruit. Uh, this particular variety gets a little bit taller than the others, you know, 20 to 25 feet tall by about 15 to 20 foot wide. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. I know we discussed a lot, a lot of different trees, but hopefully you jotted some of the varieties down that may be of interest to you. Again, if you have any questions regarding these trees, or if you'd like to come see them uh, once spring arrives, give us a call, give us an email, again, info at DaytonNursery.com. If you have any further questions about other trees or the trees mentioned in this video, feel free to comment below. Uh, we'll, we will see those and we will go ahead and answer for you. 
but I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it for you, so we hope to see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.